So, good afternoon. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the World Health Summit in a session that's sponsored by the Berlin Institute of Health, the Montreal Clinical Research Institute, the Max Delbruck Center, and the M8 Alliance on precision medicine and population health. We'll have a panel discussion, so this is why we're having these chairs here, but um, as is often the case, the males in the discussion need something to hold on to, while the females don't. So we'll start with uh, three very short presentations as teasers, and then uh, we'll react to this in the discussion. So it's my great pleasure to welcome a number of very eminent discussants, starting with Elizabeth Blackburn from San Diego. Would you please come up here to the podium and take the chair that you like best? Um, then Enela Bonfiglioli from Microsoft, the lady who thinks that PowerPoint is not necessary. Um, then Alvin Böttinger was at the Berlin Institute of Health and the University of Potsdam. Tarek Moroy from the uh, University of Montreal in Canada. And finally, Andreas Radbruch from the German Rheumatism Research Institute here in Berlin. And without much ado, and before you sit down, um, you are going to start, either from here or from your chair, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Hold on. I just have this one slide to hold on. <laughs> Can you see me? No, it has to go down. So I was actually told up front to prepare a 10-minute talk, but I, this was corrected by now, and I was supposed to actually put it all together in one slide, which I have in the very end. And uh, that's actually my, um, my summary, my in uh, introduction statement. Uh, I think that in precision medicine, DNA sequencing still has to prove its value. Uh, transcriptome or RNA sequencing of course, has already proven its value, but uh, the tools that have evolved over thousands or hundreds of thousands of years together with us, um, and that's our immune system, uh, actually should not be neglected, and I think they have an enormous potential uh, for precision uh, in medicine, to increase the precision in medicine. Uh, and uh, the points uh, where they are of particular value, I think, is that the cells of the immune system have evolved as systemic biosensors of danger and of, um, of, uh, non, of pathological situations. And as biosensors, they will express uh, genes as biosignatures, and some of them may be actually qualify as biomarkers for precise diagnostic qualification and even prediction of response to therapy, which at least in my um, corner of medicine, that is chronic inflammatory diseases, is a huge socioeconomic um, uh, topic. Everybody is aware that antibodies for targeted therapies, monoclonal antibodies, have um, revolutionized medicine and uh, now among the top 10 uh, drugs uh, in terms of sales, uh, there's, uh, I think, eight or nine uh, monoclonal antibodies. And just coming up uh, is the importance of checkpoint inhibition in the fight against cancer. And what I see in the future is also, also stimulation of checkpoints uh, in the therapy of chronic inflammatory diseases. And the cellular therapies have well, as well made it actually to the headlines, that the stem cell uh, therapies, uh, the engineered T cell therapies, and NK cell therapies, which prove more and more the value. And finally, we should not forget actually about last point, the value of the immune system um, in providing protection uh, upon uh, vaccination. That would be my introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being clear and for being short uh, and precise. So this is a step towards precision medicine. <laughs> Tarek, uh, it's your turn now.
Thank you very much. Of course, I have many more slides to show, and I use shamelessly the occasion to, to use them. I will be That's quick, good. though, uh, to be precise. Um, so uh, my institute is the Montreal Clinical Research Institute, and we are affiliated with the University of Montreal. And this slide, I brought this slide up to say that if you ever wondered who Detlef, uh, where Detlef Ganten got his PhD, it was at this institute in the late 60s, early 70s, and the diploma was given to him by McGill University. Uh, just had to make this remark, sorry for that. So we have, uh, this is a institute affiliated to university and with uh, 440 researchers, students, staff, um, about 40 million budget, 200 papers per year. So just to give you a, a brief overview of what we are doing, wh where, we are, where we are, and what are the major uh, parameters of our institution. Um, why do we, I would like to take a case uh, with my talk about biomarkers uh, for precision medicine. And the biomarkers I'm going to talk about, and maybe we'll discuss it later on a little bit, is not genetic, but they are proteomic protein biomarkers. As you know, we spend uh, millions, if not billions, of dollars on therapeutic drugs. But much of this is wasted because many of these drugs are not effective, and this is only seen once uh, survival curves or any other clinical parameters looked at. And we've seen that uh, of a certain population treated, a big percentage of the population is not responding. And this is, has a big cost um, according to the journal of personalized medicine. So precision medicine relies on the development of diagnostics to predict responsiveness um, of patients and more effective treatments are expected to reduce health system costs. And there is one a big example in Montreal about a cardiovascular drug that was already put aside uh, of being useless. And then a famous researcher in Montreal looked at the genetics of the population and, this, and found that 30% were responders, but if you take the whole population of patients, they were not apparent. So the drug was taken out of the waste bin and put back onto the market. Uh, attention to one uh, genetic marker. Now, clinical proteomics uh, is uh, a proteomic platform that supports the rapid development and validation of targeted assays for the quantification of human biomarker protein, uh, proteins using mass spectrometry. And I would uh, have a few slides to, to explain you what this is and uh, what you can do with it. So um, you know that proteins are, have post-translational modifications. And a, a ELISA, for instance, detects the protein, but it doesn't detect the variants, for instance, phosphorylated, uh, methylated, acetylated, and so on. And peptides or proteins that have modified, they are modified, have different functions, and can be very valid as biomarkers. And uh, we would, uh, at the RCM, put the case forward that if you could discover the PTMs, discover the peptides, uh, would, you would be able to more precisely diagnose disease, predict the onset of evolution of disease, uh, stratify patients, um, assist the drug discovery process, and better understand mechanisms of disease. So how this is going to work? This is called um, protein affinity capture coupled with quantitative mass spectrometry, uh, PAC-QMS. Well, we, we all love abbreviations, so please keep that in mind for future use. So what does it do? You, uh, in principle, you have a sample of patient's plasma, and then the plasma is analyzed by... Um, a device that is as the, the yellow pipette tip, but the yellow pipette tip is covered with antibodies against a specific protein. And then you take a little sample of the plasma and purify the protein via this antibody. And then the purified protein is digested and um, is not digested, but it's taken uh, uh, and given to sample processing and then to the mass spec. And what you can detect is peptides. Uh, of a specific marker protein, and only the peptides, but you can detect the peptides that are post-translationally modified. So you can do this with digestion or non-digestion, with trypsin or other, th uh, or other things. Some of the proteins will already be pre-digested uh, because they are cut or uh, processed in, in the human bloodstream. And you can see down here that we have already some candidates for cardiovascular disease as PCSK9 peptides, or we have some for rare disease, TSC1 or 2, and so on. Uh, in the plasma, you have a number, a huge number of clinically used biomarkers in yellow, if you look at the yellow dots, and you have a lot of proteins that were discussed by the, by, discovered by the HUPO, the Human Proteomic Organization, 
to be of value for uh, proteomic biomarkers. One example being PCSK9, it discovered at the RCM in the year 2003. And now all the cardiovascular people know this is the hottest, uh, one of the hottest targets for the pharmaceutical industry. And PCSK9 uh, inhibits um, the LDL receptor to clear cholesterol from the, from the bloodstream. Uh, if you inhibit PCSK9, the cholesterol level drop. Uh, they drop much faster and more sustainable than with statins. So it was of interest for the pharmaceutical industry to, uh, to develop uh, antibodies or uh, antagonists for PCSK9. But PCSK9 is a proprotein convertase, and it's cleaved itself. And in the plasma, you have peptides of PCSK9, and some of these peptides are phosphorylated or modified. And uh, multi multiple reaction monitoring, for instance, for PCSK9 um, showed that um, so the associations with PCSK9 peptides and metabolic phenotypes that you cannot detect with ELISA. And that most of the circulating PCSK9 is phosphorylated, and uh, this phosphorylation, for instance, just to give you one example for clinical proteomics as biomarkers, is correlated with insulin resistance in obese patients. This all to say that you can use clinical proteomics, immunoprofied uh, peptides from the plasma and analyze them by mass spectrometry and correlate them with disease states to discover novel discriminating biomarkers for various physiological conditions and disorders. And uh, this is the person in our institute behind this uh, entire uh, clinical proteomics thing, is Benoit Coulomb. Uh, he is the mass spec guy, that is the more uh, easy <laughs> transaction of director for translational proteomics. And he has, this, he has set up this biomarker pipeline for precision medicine, and uh, currently he has a list of uh, a number of biomarkers um, detected as modified peptides in human plasma that correlates with disease states in, in cohorts of human patients. Um, there are a lot of people I have to thank you, the Coulomb Lab, uh, and to thank uh, the Coulomb Lab and the SEDA Lab and the clinics at the RCM. And, uh, of course, we have support by all kinds of sources, and three I would like to mention, which because they are um, from the private sector, Sanofi, uh, Regeneron, and the foundation, the Fondation Le Duc. And I think that's uh, my case for um, biomarkers with clinical proteomics for the precision medicine and population health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tariq, on this outlook of proteomics to increase diagnostic uh, levels and stratify patients. And now we come to Erwin Bertinger, who is coming to us from the University of Potsdam and who will be talking of his view on yes. how to stratify patients. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk to you and take a very clear position here today that indeed precision medicine and population health go together. And uh, we'll be happy to discuss this. Before you, you have a person who is on a journey for personalized medicine for at least 10 years, 2007. I founded the Institute for Personalized Medicine with support of Mr. Bronfman at the Icon School of Medicine uh, at Mount Sinai in New York and have since uh, had the privilege and the honor to work in Berlin at the Berlin Institute of Health and most recently at the Hasso Plattner Institute starting uh, the first of this month where we want to bring personalized medicine, precision medicine and digitalization in healthcare together uh, to improve population health. So this was the question that you also have in your um, uh, uh, brochure. Will the precision medicine approach become valuable uh, ally in improving population health, or will its effects be negligible? And my answer to you, and I'm happy to discuss any position also challenging my view, is that digitization of healthcare will drive precision medicine approaches and improve quality and efficiency in population health management. And I'll be very brief uh, showing you some data that we have generated in terms of bringing precision medicine or personalized medicine into clinical care. We've done it, and we have some results that are very encouraging. We're not just talking about it, and I'll show you some slides from our work that is still ongoing at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, where we have, out of 40,000 patients that have consented for precision medicine research, 
in a clinical care context and data from the electronic health record and genomic data identified a gene, apolipoprotein L1, ApoL1 short, and specific variants of uh, this gene we found are particularly associated with increased blood pressure and an early onset of high blood pressure in African-American populations. And the effects are quite uh, significant, about three millimeters mercury for those of you who work with high blood pressure and uh, hypertension, that's very significant. It's a very strong effect of this marker on uh, the uh, blood pressure in this population. And the, the point here is this is in younger African-Americans, 20 to 40 years of age, and here we have a genetic market that can be tested in any time. And with regard to population health, I would argue there are few entities that are more important than high blood pressure and hypertension with lots of uh, disease burden being associated with high blood pressure. And here we have now an opportunity, a genetic marker in a population that typically does not engage in healthcare early on in life where we have this marker and we can specify a very much increased risk for high blood pressure and we could work with our public health and population health uh, folks in primary care uh, to say when this marker is present in an individual, blood pressure should be screened more often uh, because there's a very high chance the blood pressure will be increased and lead to early onset hypertension. So now what do we do with this? We have this information and as so often in genomic medicine we have genetic markers and we have phenotypes and we have statistics that link the two, but the in-between, the proteomics and the in-between, we have often no idea how the genetic marker actually translates into, on a mechanistic level, into a disease phenotype. And so it is with hypertension. Here you have just a slide where we have for many years, for decades, understood genes and environment have an impact. But we have not made much progress in characterizing how genes and environment for this very important disease and condition for public health and population health come together. And so I would propose that we are at the dawn of a new era, uh, the third generation health data era. When we take our current approach with second generation where we have digital data uh, that is documented in the interaction with the health system. This is periodic, it's lagging, it depends on the documentation by a clinician, by an intermediary, and it's certainly not present in real time. And I think we now have an era before us where we have a third generation health data that is data that is real time, that is continuous, that is ubiquitous and physiological. And in particular, for the context of genetics and environmental factors driving blood pressure and uh, high blood pressure and hypertension, we will increasingly rely on data from telemonitoring, sensors, and so on, uh, from individuals directly transmitted into uh, the health data context. At the Hasso Plattner Institute, we are setting up a digital health center to particularly drive uh, this aspect, and uh, one uh, initiative is the development of the health cloud where all data, second generation, third generation, and other, and omics data and biomarker data can be brought together under control of the individual that the data is derived from. Uh, we will do that uh, here in, in Germany, uh, and we will also do this in New York. We will have two hubs for this, bringing data together. For instance, data that I explained to you in the beginning that led to the discovery of APOL1 and blood pressure from Mount Sinai with 40,000 patients, electronic health record data, genome sequence data, and uh, we will also uh, uh, there not only try to understand a precision medicine, but also what does it do in a clinical care context. We have a system, digital system, that interacts with the electronic health record, and I promised you data. We have two uh, pilot projects in precision medicine ongoing. One, pharmacogenomics using genetic markers to predict the responsiveness of an individual to a, uh, a particular drug that is ordered. When we use this, 70% uh, of the clinicians at Mount Sinai uh, will actually change their prescription uh, to a drug that works in the individual based on the genetic data that uh, specifies uh, which drug would work or not. And with regard to blood pressure, if individuals and doctors know that there's an increased genetic risk for blood pressure and uh, downstream uh, sequela complications, uh, the blood pressure control three months after sharing the information with a digital tool, clinical decision support, will be significantly improved, as you can see here 
Uh, the red line is for those that are APOL1 positive after three months of sharing the information with all involved in the care will be significantly improved. At the Berlin Institute of Health, I had the privilege for two years to work with great colleagues and devise a strategy that is also focusing on personalized medicine and advanced therapies. So we have a very strong footprint here in Berlin in the capital region. And together, I think uh, we can uh, drive with an international partnership and community uh, precision medicine and digital health. And my argument would be that it will improve population health management and enable a value-oriented learning health system. And I'll look forward to an uh, inspired discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erwin, for the outlook on digital data. And that, I think, leads directly to Microsoft and Elena. We're looking forward to how you view the situation. Absolutely. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, in fact, when you think about the quest for precision medicine, um, I think that is not new. If we look back at... Um, Hippocrates and, and the four humors, and then we bring it to today to the four founding elements of uh, the DNA, you know, the tools are different. That is what has changed. And so let me give you some uh, reflections on where technology comes in as a pivotal change. I would summarize in four um, elements what has become different. Number one, the, the amount of data that really allows us to go faster into precision medicine. And when I say uh, amount of data that is available, is it first, second, third generation type of data? The question is, how do you handle it in a way that extracts the right information? You know, just to give you a sense of, of what we're talking about, if you take um, one byte as uh, one, one, one byte in terms of computing uh, as a grain of, of rice, genomics in 2025 will have enough data in the terms of 40 as a byte. You know, that means 40 times a blanket of rice over the west coast of the United States. Just to give a sense, that's what we are having to handle. And at the same time, the second thing that changed is really the computational capacity and the speed at which we can do things. Why Microsoft is in the picture? Of course, when you have um, so much data to handle and you have to give diagnosis faster, you um, come to, to, to the point where you can use cloud computing, they say sequencing in the cloud in a safe and secure way. That is where Microsoft Genomics, actually a team that we have in Microsoft, has been developing algorithms to do some of the genetic processing seven times faster. So take a person that has rare diseases and give them a diagnosis seven times faster. That is life-changing. So data, computational capacity, speed. Then the other thing is really integration, bringing all this data together and bringing all the various players together. Because if you're not able to then connect the results, what we call from, from sample to answer process, the results of that genetic sequencing into my electronic medical records with the right solution so that if um, a doctor looks at that medical record and if he wants to test a specific drug, that can happen in an integrated way, then we keep failing and we keep missing the promise. And then the, the, the last element which I think has massively changed is when you look at uh, the precision medicine initiative that uh, former President Obama has been launching, he called for um, citizen scientists, he called for volunteers, right? He called for people to be able to share their data. So that element of data donation, of how we're able to contribute to something that is greater than ourselves as citizens before we become patient, is something that is changing in the level of consciousness and definitely needs to change also the level of our policies. Microsoft um, has been uh, engaged with Oxford Research Institute to look at European framework for data donation. If we do not have all these building blocks and if, you know, 
technologists, biologists, oncologists do not collaborate. We're not going to really uh, make that 2,000 year quest a reality. So even though you say it's not new, it appears there's a lot of things that are new indeed. <laughs> Thank you. So we now come to our last speaker. <laughs> yes, please, little Blackburn. I, th I think what has been summed up, uh, or I can sum up the, the points that have been made here, are really emphasizing the extraordinary sophistication and technological situation that we're in right now. And, and I'd just like to make, make two points that really strike me as, a, as, a, as a, you know, a lifelong scientist and now somebody who leads a research institute whose mission is very much bringing the benefits of uh, research to humanity, which means a lot of partnering. Now, and the first point that we've heard about is getting all the data that we can and bringing it from citizen science, from biobanks, into a system where we can analyze it. And, and really what's very important is making sure that the quality of that data is good. Uh, a famous scientist at Stanford used to say regarding doing biological research on biochemical materials, garbage in, garbage out. So, <laughs> so, so making sure that that data has, for example, biological integrity or integrity of the records so that what goes in <laughs> is really, really high quality, and that means collaborating over standards to make sure that data goes in that is worthwhile spending a huge amount of computational power and uh, you know, human power in understanding. So that's the first point I think that will be really important to always be keeping in mind as we realize the promise of precision medicine, precision prevention, precision health, they're all one and the same continuum in, in my mind. And so, um, so, so the second thing that I keep being struck by is we're, we're all sort of awed by the amount of data going in, right? We're just you know, overwhelmed, and that means computational power, which fortunately gets more and more uh, you know, uh, dramatically good, is taken care of it, but we're still sort of overwhelmed by it. And I think we're going to get to a point where we're going to need to start distilling this data into what are the clear, emergent, important kinds of data. Um, you know, a Newtonian uh, motion, a law of motion, you know, what that really comes from is a lot of, uh, you know, subatomic particles interacting, right? I mean, and yet we don't have to refer to every subatomic particle in deducing how some emergent property is going to appear. And in our case, of course, the emergent property is going to be, you know, the health, the well-being, the disease curing of that very complex entity, which is the human. And so, um, so I, I'm, I'm excited about how can that collaborative kind of culture that we've been talking about that's so important start to work with the very large amount of data that we've been talking about, starting to distill the really critical kinds of uh, informative emergent properties. And so I think this is clearly going to be, you know, biologists will need to bring insights, clinicians will need to bring insights. We're needing to come back to that patient again, that individual. And so um, one, one quick point I'd like to make, which, which has come from research that you know, I've been interested in over years and then which I've seen uh, develop in various ways, but really relates to the point of precision medicine. So looking at how the ends of chromosomes, that was my research interest and is for, you know, was for many, many years, how the chromosome ends wear down, which has consequences on cells in our body, which do play out over decades of human life. So there are ways that that does uh, accelerate certain kinds of disease properties and certain properties of aging. Okay, so, so let's say the most non-precision medicine example, but a very population kind of example would be, let's look at how the telomeres have worn down in a population of 100,000 people. This is not theoretical, this was actually done uh, through the Kaiser Permanente Health System in California, and it was a collaboration with the University of California, San Francisco. And so 100,000 people consented. They did a huge amount of survey data, um, and a lot of information went in from their clinical records.
records, but we asked a very simple question of those 100,000 people who ranged in age from 20 to 100 and are all sorts of very, very diverse population, as it turns out. We just said, um, depending on your telomere length, how likely are you to die in the next three years? Pretty simple outcome. And the, question, the answer was actually about 25% more likely to die, any cause, in those next three years if your telomeres were in the bottom quartile of the population distribution. Very simple number. And then you could say, well, maybe that's uh, you know, something if you do multivariate analysis, it'll go away. It stayed very, very strong. It was barely changed. So it was an independent predictor. But that's not a very useful clinical number. But here's where precision medicine you know, exemplifies, and, and it makes the point, which is um, now let's look at some cancer patients. This is a real experiment again, and uh, I think it exemplifies why precision medicine works, is, is so important, and how important it is to look at the right parameters. So this was um, a study from MD Anderson Cancer Center, and it was about 440 patients. They came in with bladder cancer, all sorts of patients, you know, 440, and they measured telomere length in their white blood cells, which is the common way of doing it. And then that said, they look out over many years and said, what's the median survival? And it was a small um, effect if you had telomeres in the bottom uh, a half of the distribution, just a median split. So, you know, if your telomeres were shorter in your white blood cells, it, it made a bit of a difference. Uh, it, it was worse if your telomeres were shorter, but not that much worse. Uh, the median survival was, you know, well over five years. But they also asked something else, which is the whole organism is where the cancer is growing. They asked about depression. And on a 32-point scale, median split asked if you're in the most depressed half of that scale, what happens to your cancer risk? Now the median uh, survival is about five years. So it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of an effect. If you were both depressed and you had shorter telomeres at the time of that cancer diagnosis, now by five years, everybody in that category was dead. And in fact, the median survival was well down around two years. So this is now clinically very you know, real. And, and I think just em exemplifies two things. That there are going to be very useful emergent properties of the huge amount of data that will start to come out. And, and uh, I think we, we need to be getting to that very quickly because um, I think sometimes we're just overly stunned by the amount of data that we're dealing with. We have to start distilling it into useful things. And, and I have no doubt that that will be much, much more sophisticated than this very simple example that I gave you. But the principle, I, I think, is there. Uh, finally, I'd like to say one more thing, which is that I think technologies that are starting to be used for medicine and which you know, rely on this extraordinarily deep and complex amount of data we're getting, Interestingly, I think they're going to start relying more and more on biology. And I'd like to come back to our first speaker who pointed out that the immune system is probably one of the worst, most sophisticated biosensor systems. It's also a very, very, very powerful cancer and other disease-fighting system as well as exacerbator. And more, the more we're learning from the precision medicine data sets about biology, the more we're realizing that's going to be the way that are probably the most effective ways to um, combat now diseases. And, you know, just look at cancer. We've seen going from, you know, uh, understanding, you know, in the old days, steel, so you could have surgical instruments, so you could treat cancer with surgery, to understanding chemistry, so we could treat cancers with drugs by understanding the chemistry of, uh, you know, molecules that can be used as drug treatments. And now understanding the sophistication of biology, so now we can start using that. And the immune therapy, of course, is the poster child for that. And so I think that's where we're going to see another output of precision medicine, precision prevention, provision, precision health. We're going to be able to start using this really sophisticated biological information as, as uh, perhaps you know, one of our most effective ways of ensuring health. So those are the points I'd like to make. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So it tells us that uh, we better take care both of our depression and our telomere ends if we want to survive. But I would like to close the circle, and Andreas Radbuch uh, should 
we should come back with you to immunology as the perhaps the most interesting field where both diagnostics and therapeutic options are becoming more and more precise. And maybe you could take this up and tell us a little bit about where you see that this will be going. Yeah, I, I started that actually uh, with my brief introductory comment, and I think uh, understanding the sophistication of the immune system more and more in recent years, and I think we are by far not understanding it now, um, actually teaches us how, um, how nature has come up with a system that has an extreme specificity and, uh, and a very sophisticated way to discriminate, to sense danger and to sense pathological situations and uh, to alarm uh, other cells and, uh, and then to react actually in a, in a way that uh, can be very efficient. It can also be disastrous and can have actually pathological side effects itself. Um, but th I think it's, it's a lesson that we uh, get uh, taught. Can I shift a little bit uh, to, to the topic of, of data amount and data um, uh, getting a, gra a grisp, uh, grasp on, on the data? I think we are vastly underestimating the number of data that will come up. Uh, and it always, I myself actually am working in a field where the heritability uh, of uh, diseases is less than 30%, so the rest is environment. And, um, and probably everybody in the audience knows that uh, of the genes um, uh, that we have, uh, only about 1% are the genes of our cells, and 99% are the genes of the microbiome. And it, it turns out uh, more and more evidence accumulates uh, that the microbiome, that the dialogue between the microbiome and the body is of extreme importance to keep us either healthy or induce or permit certain uh, diseases. So I think um, uh, we, we should, um, for me the term precision medicine is pretty unprecise, so everybody has a different understanding on that and it's evolving itself uh, and uh, I think that's probably the task now uh, of our little discussion here to fill it with life and, and add facets that somehow um, might uh, show that we are just at the beginning actually of, a, of an interesting journey into adding more and more tools and insights into medicine that allow actually in the end to treat every individual patient as an individual. Thank you. Now from these presentations I'd like to distill a few points that uh, we should perhaps concentrate on. One is uh, the initial remark that uh, at least, I understood, at least 50% of all drugs that are being taken are wasted. And I hope that we'll be able to uh, discuss this also with everybody who is here in the audience. And I hope there are some people who will contradict this because otherwise uh, perhaps the pharmaceutical industry will have to half their revenues within very short period of time if that's the decision that we take. So uh, are, are so many drugs wasted uh, in our current treatment? Then we had the issue of data quality. I think that's very important then, uh, because if, if the data are not good, then we may be misled in many ways, uh, both in our research but also in our every, everyday practice. Um, an issue that comes up immediately, at least in Germany, when you talk about data is also data protection. Is that necessary? Are people willing to share it? Uh, and what do we need to do this? Um, and uh, also a question is, what do we do with unwanted data that come up that may have a predictive power uh, and there may be nothing uh, that we can do about it? And um, then I would like to ask, and that, that's the point uh, that I'd like to start with, uh, how can we actually do clinical trials or how can we be sure about the suitable therapies if the complexity of data will bring us down in the end to a single individual? And let me take those examples that you mentioned here. Uh, Erwin, you mentioned the, a single uh, genetic variant that determines how blood pressure uh, is affected. 
Uh, we also heard the telomere length or uh, the presence or absence of depression being determinants of outcome. Now, that sounds fairly easy if we have a yes or no division and we, we form two groups. But let's imagine we take a million parameters and we have now all sorts of permutations. Let's say Erwin's... Uh, a genetic variant will now be screened in depressed and non-depressed patients with or without shortened telomere length and another 15 genetic variants that may also be present. How would we then distill the useful information? I think one of you two would be uh, destined to take this up. I'll take up one you will. point Good. Yes, because it relates to your 50% wastage of medicine, and it f ties in. So, so there's an interesting study that was reported by um, colleagues, which included uh, my colleague at the Salk Institute, Rusty Gage, and it was looking at how, will somebody respond or not to lithium? Not one of the most expensive drugs, but um, it's very useful in depression, but nobody knows why or who. And so what he did was, in essence, did precision medicine in the following way, took cells from the responders and the non-responders, turned them into neurons in vitro by, you know, modern technologies that people have done for transdifferentiation and, you know, things that were based initially on IPS cell generation and now have gone the next generation, and asked these in vitro neurons from the responders and non-respondents what are their gene expression profiles. So deep sequencing, lots of data come out. Did machine learning on the two groups and just said, what's the difference? And then with 92% accuracy could predict who would be a responder or a not responder. So, so I think this is an example where, you know, there's not a lot of money in lithium, right? And yet there's a tremendous impact of depression. As we know, you know, it's World Health Organization has in certain Middle Eastern countries, I believe it's now one of the leading causes of disability among women, for example. And so, so you know, there's, there's really big impacts. And so if you have a really good predictor of something like who will respond to a simple available drug like lithium, you've got something that's really worth its while investing in that um, precision medicine. So maybe the machine learning can reduce it to something rather than the entire genome. But it was very important to get all of that data to show that you could do that. Um, so uh, I think... There's a ton of data that you get, and yet probably it's going to be distillable into something that doesn't require that patient to have, you know, for the pre-lithium, to have the entire transcriptome done on their in vitro transformed cells. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can see the direction now that one could go. Maybe yes. Eleanor. Yes, and I, I, I couldn't agree more, Liz, with the, the approaches that are being taken now, A, where uh, you generate model systems from affected individuals with phenotypes and without phenotypes, with exposure and without exposure, such that you mentioned, like you take organoid cultures, generate uh, cells from individuals, and the technology is fantastic now to lead us into a new era of uh, actually individualized mechanistic studies that you've mentioned, both with regard to responsiveness to treatments, but also with regard to mechanisms that drive disease in individuals. So I do believe that these humanized uh, model systems um, derived from stem cells and so on are, are very important to can fill I, the gap. Yeah. Can I correct you? This was just simply taking cells from the individuals, but yeah. they weren't humanized. They were just in vitro. So, uh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so it was practical because yeah. you didn't have to take brain cells. Yeah. You took skin cells. And just, skin cells yes, and... And, uh, and then uh, turned them into the relevant that, cell right. type. Pluripotent so very cells. doable in, in patients. Sorry, Sorry. I didn't yeah. mean to No, no, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's clear. And the second point is that I, I think also we, we are still caught in a... Um, biostatistical way of looking at things, right? Where we uh, have uh, hypotheses, null hypotheses, p-value tests, and so on. That's all very good uh, in terms of uh, a, a check before things go into medical practice, right? In, in, a, in a clinical trial, right? But in way of discovery um, and finding new patterns, as Liz has mentioned, machine learning approaches, new approaches to 
bring together uh, uh, heterogeneous types of data that in a biostatistical sense we would never put together, right? But in a machine learning sense we want to have uh, complex data. Uh, I, I put out the, the slide with regard to hypertension and as uh, Andreas Radbruch mentioned in immunology, uh, it's very clear that there's heritability but with the genetic information that we have we cannot explain heritability. So we need to look at environmental factors in a new way that I put out in, in the context of hypertension together with the genetics and take very new approaches such as machine learning um, to uh, unearth, to, to find new patterns. And uh, I think, so bringing this together, I'm very excited about this point in time being the start of a new era of learning how disease develop and of learning how uh, we can find the right treatment for the right person. Can I make a comment on the, you mentioned the statistics, just if we go back to the um, effectiveness of pharma. It is interesting to see that if you look back 2005, there was about 5% of the drugs that were in the pipe that, you know, followed the way of precision medicine. When you look at the statistics today, it's 45%. So I think that yesterday's waste, but there is also a trajectory of hope. Even if, when, when you look at um, the lack of effectiveness of the drug on a specific individual. It goes from, let's say, about 30% in, in depression cases to 75% ineffectiveness in the case of cancer. So there is still, when you, what we call waste is also a huge um, impact on the human experience. So imagine um, the similarity between biological processes and computational processes. They are about the way you handle and process information, the way you map it, the way you understand what changes. We have actually uh, a team of researchers in Cambridge, UK, that is looking at uh, mirroring biological processes with computational processes and one could say programming cells, meaning understanding how cells develop and grow and what goes wrong. And so when you can mirror computationally, a healthy system, and understand what goes different in a system that gets unhealthy, and you can intervene before. That really, it's, it's, it's a future that is actually at hand. I, I just wanted to come back to the topic of wasted uh, uh, medicines or drugs. Uh, in, in the chronic inflammatory diseases, uh, it actually is, it's crystal clear that precision medicine has to improve there in predicting the response because uh, for all these biologicals, uh, the response rate is about 30 to 50 percent, 60 percent at most. So that, uh, and that is, uh, that is a disaster for those patients who do not respond because the uh, disease progresses and the tissue damage is irreversible. And, uh, and also the chance f to, in uh, to induce uh, remission, uh, therapy-free remission, decreases actually uh, uh, with, the, with the progression of the disease. So um, it is very, and, and the costs of such a therapy are 20 to 30,000 euro per year. Actually, these medicines would be most effective if they would be used very early in the disease, but even our system, wealthy system in Germany, cannot afford that and they are usually used as last resort drugs because of this uh, economic impact. But if we could predict actually who will respond to this therapy, we could immediately as soon as we have the clinical diagnosis, we could actually treat with the right drug and get the effect that we want to get. And for the individual and the society, that was, is just a dramatic difference. Yeah, I'm very happy that I put this sentence on my slide. Uh, it stimulated the discussion, um, but you're welcome. <laughs> I think, well, yeah, a number of drugs are not respond. Patients do not respond to certain drugs. But it's not a complete waste because in many cases or some cases, the drugs that have not been effective in one disease, and we have seen that example, is effective in another disease. And the situation that we have today is that we have a huge amount of compounds and drugs. Some of them will be repurposed. We have even research programs for repurposing, which comes from first efforts of precision medicine and indicating that this is not effective there, but will be effective there. And the other thing I would like to come back, you say, yeah, we have so many markers and how will this all come together? I think what will happen, uh, this is a prediction and a hypothesis, we will have 
algorithms of and diagnostic decision trees for clinicians that will bring in patient data, that will bring in genomic data, and they will bring in uh, the available biomarkers and make decisions. It's a complex algorithms, bioinformatics and computational informatics will help to do that. It will be, and I'm a little bit you know, going ahead in the future and the clinicians in the room can, can correct me, there will be a web applications in the future that behind this web applications will be a huge amount of different markers and data and will guide the clinician with artificial intelligence to the therapy that is the best for the patients. This is the way we are going forward. We are in the beginning, but we can already see in some cases that this will lead to the best way forward for the patients. For instance, for those primary immunodeficiencies that are inherited, where you have a set of 300 genes, for instance, uh, and with mutations that are linked to specific therapies and specific uh, diagnosis, but which are not applied because all the knowledge is not specifically and systematically known for these patients. But these are rare diseases. They suffer a lot, as you say. They have this diagnostic odyssey. So this will be applied for these patients, and these patients are very willing to participate. They are very willing to share their data. They do everything to have a diagnosis. And these groups of patients will bring this diagnostic decision tree com complex markers, multiple markers forward, and we'll learn from them, and then we'll go on to the more common diseases. May I uh, perhaps exaggerate this, this uh, situation a bit? And as you said, uh, in many cases, you have response rates of 30 or 60 percent. Now, if I remember right, my pharmacology lectures that I used to give every term, uh, the number needed to treat is an important parameter on whether a drug is, uh, is approved, but also on how well you consider it and how much you use it. Number needed to treat is, means you have to treat so many patients so that one of them benefits. And the number needed to treat in many instances in, is incredibly high. Uh, some, some cardiovascular drugs have numbers that are well above 100. So we treat 100 patients, one of them will benefit. Um, we are uncertain whether this is due to biological noise and it's just statistics or whether it's something that we could predict. So my question would go to Erwin, who is closest to this, I think. What is your suggestion? Do you think that ultimately we'll be able, to, let's say we have a drug that has a number needed to treat of 100 so that one benefits, that we will be able to, ben to predict who is the one patient who will benefit or do you think there'll be There'll be noise and we'll come down in the numbers, but we'll not find this patient. What's your feeling? Well, I think, again, I think it, we will get better and better in predicting, particularly with the new approaches that have been discussed. But at, at this point in time, we have uh, sort of predictive power uh, to assess whether a patient will benefit from a drug or not for certain drugs and, the, and, and, and genetic markers and also bioassays particularly for medicines that depend on uh, internal metabol metabolism, on metabolizing enzymes, cytochrome P450, uh, to convert a prodrug to an active form. And there we have, in, in an increasing number of instances, drug gene pairs. Uh, we can generate the information, give the information uh, to the patient and the treating physician, and have them make a decision about whether this is the drug that should be used or an alternative drug, uh, have that decision made on an informed basis, I think. Uh, this is not so much about you know, studies and design and generating evidence towards uh, uh, new medications, uh, but this is for clinical practice at this point in time. It is by far not uh, available such information for every medication out there but for a good number of antidepressants for uh, uh, treatments, platelet inhibitors and so on, um, um, there, there is this information available and we're struggling at this point bringing it into the clinical decision-making process and that's what I showed to you. We have a pilot project where this is happening and in fact in 70% of such cases where the information clearly suggests you should use an alternative drug, physicians and patients are following the alternative path. So I think we have a way to improve uh, this, um, this context, um, uh, but uh, certainly we're not 
by no means in a position to say we can apply this across all medications. I wanted to bring the scenario that was very well articulated in terms of um, what artificial intelligence could do if we had all the various types of data integrated to actually um, examples that are, are real, are very near to us. So, in fact, it is interesting to see as this is no longer you know, science fiction or a, a very far off vision. Let's take uh, um, the recently formed alliance of uh, uh, biobanks from, from across the world, you know, from, from Estonia to the UK, um, to the US, Mexico, and, uh, and Poland and other countries, uh, in which uh, um, they, they do share the data, they do have um, the opportunity to bring together the uh, genetic data, the, phenotyp the phenotypic data, to integrate it with electronic medical records, so to the specific condition of one specific patient, and then do an ecosystem, actually, of artificial intelligence solutions, because one will never be the solution to everything. We need to start to think about ecosystems. How do we integrate the various solutions in clinical practice? This is, I think, important because one of the things that has been holding us back in the promise of precision medicine is the silos and the fragmentation. And so open, scalable, interoperable systems and solutions are going to make it real today. And, and we start to see this type of opportunities coming together. Finland, for example, has launched in the southern region, Helsinki and New Zima, a, a data-driven, health data-driven new ecosystem in which what you described is starting to be experimented. So I think it's very promising to see that happening in reality. Expand. I couldn't agree more. I think this is really very, very important. And given how much this can offer, you know, we also have to be realizing there are other impediments. And um, I'm, I'm going to give a very concrete example. Somebody I know at, at my research institute said, I, I have a dilemma. I serve on the tumor, molecular tumor board. They talk about treatment of a patient with targeted therapies uh, appropriate to the mutations in the cancer that are clearly the drivers, that, you know, but other mutation was present that also had a treatment, that targeted treatment against that, but the clinical trials so far had indicated toxicity. So the practicing oncologist treating the patients were very reluctant because of malpractice risks to use this drug, which every rational... Um, indication said this drug should be used because here's the mutation but the trials had said there was toxicity and so that could raise liability so we have to look at speaking of ecosystems we have to look at the ecosystem of health delivery and this of course I'm talking about a situation in the US that may not be general but but that is so important because that clearly was the impediment to using something that rationally look like it should have been a drug of choice to be added into the regimen. So I think we, we have a long way to go because there's no point having these advances until we've set up uh, situations where the other parts of the system, which ultimately is bringing it to the patient, that that part of, is working as well. Yeah, this is really my, my next question. You know, we are, in, in medical practice, we are very much driven today uh, by what we call evidence-based medicine, which means we do clinical trials, often huge clinical trials involving tens of thousands of patients and giving us a statistical favorite uh, treatment, uh, which may often be only by a small margin. Now, it's, it's obvious that these trials are not really how we can do this in the future. And so my question goes to you, Tariq, perhaps as first. How, if we get all these biomarkers, how are we going to do trials, or will that stop? Will we use machine learning tools uh, to predict uh, outcome and, and forget about trials? Well, I, I think I cannot really answer that. But what I think what this will happen, uh, the large cohorts of thousands of patients that you mentioned um, genomic data will be used to stratify them. 
and to reinterpret the data. And you see this already in papers, in scientific papers. You've, someone finds a SNP, a mutation, and re-stratified stratifies clinical data already done, right? And now the curves look completely different. Then you have high, medium, low expression, a presence, absence, or heterozygosity of a marker, and now you have curves that are different. And the clinical trial has been done with thousands of patients. The data are there, they are valuable, but they are reused in the light of this marker. And this will come more and more. Everyone will do this with their marker. And this will come together as a bigger picture. And so, and so far, the clinical trial was very well done. It will be restratified, it will have a conclusion and a new recommendation for the clinician. Yes, although in, in clinical practice of trials, it's the prospective trial is the big thing, is the gold standard, which in this case is no longer, probably no longer feasible. It's the retrospective analysis of data that you're, you're advocating, which would, again, change the way how we, how we would teach our medical students, how we would inform physicians on what they would do, not rely on prospective trials, but use other forms of of information retrieval and predictive power than we've taught for the past tens of years. Maybe I can add what I said about the rare disease uh, community. This is uh, a good example how to do it differently. So you recruit a cohort of patients that are very well defined. For instance, primary immunodeficiencies, something we do at the RCM, therefore I come back to that. You have already the clinical data. Now you sequence whole genome, whole exome, or, or do transcriptomics, and then you decide which way of next generation sequencing will give the best, more, most precise diagnostic that directs you to the disease therapy that's already known for that mutation that is already in the catalog of the So these are different clinical trials. These are specific small groups of inherited diseases that will lead to this, what I mentioned, as a diagnostic decision tree. So that's different from these large clinical trials that you mentioned. This is some things that's going on and will be done for this group of patients. And once the result is known for that, I think that will be translated into other. It's easier for rare disease because you have the compliance almost completely because they want to avoid their diagnostic odyssey at all costs. Uh, and uh, so they are participating. And you have smaller groups and you have the inherited disease which makes it uh, directed towards genomics. But, but aren't you even saying that we will only have rare diseases in the future because every, <laughs> exactly. every individual <laughs> will have their special kind of exactly. hypertension, their special kind of heart failure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, liver failure, etc. Exactly. You're right. That's, that, some people bring this hypothesis forward. You are one of them, apparently. Um, it's not false at all. I think we'll end up to have uh, super stratification, which make the disease rare. So it will, but it will not be all monogenic diseases. Of course um, not. Not be all. I, if I may, Martin, I would like to come back to, to two points that I, I think are very important and also um, uh, will, in the near future, um, have very practical impact in, in, in clinical medicine. And that is that we now understand the data collected in routine clinical care, in real world uh, practice of medicine and documented through electronic health record where they are in, in broad use in many countries such as the US and Scandinavia and so on. Unfortunately, in Germany, we have to catch up in, in that regard. We all know that. Um, but I give you just some examples. The example with APOL1 and blood pressure was missed in many uh, large cohorts that were set up for research purposes because the age of entry and recruitment into those studies was middle age and, and beyond. And this association is particularly strong in otherwise healthy young African Americans. And we could only find this because we were looking in electronic health record data and we could pull out that association. I'll give you another example. Um, Imer Kenny, uh, my institute in, in, in New York, had uh, uh, done a study uh, where uh, she has also looked at short stature in this population of 40,000 that are consented using electronic health record data, and we have sequence data. And she pulled out a variant in collagen 27 uh, where it uh, was strongly associated with, with a short stature. Now, what can we do with that? We can actually take that variant, and as you said, Tariq, now look in the electronic health record. What is associated with that variant in people that have that variant? 
and sure, she found that there were a whole, and she did phenome-wide association study. So you take <laughs> the genetic marker or the biomarker and you look what phenotypes are associated in an unbiased way. And she found that indeed uh, cervical spine stenosis and a, ver a, a whole slew of musculoskeletal disorders that physicians tried to, to treat in those individuals with all kinds of things, including heavy immunosuppressants, yeah, were much more likely associated with uh, that variant in a collagen gene. So now you can actually have a much more precise characterization of the often really undiagnosed, mistreated conditions that are of general nature, musculoskeletal disorders, back pain, etc. And you can, with a molecular marker, actually be saying, okay, this is not a disease that uh, warrants heavy immunosuppression. This is not a rheumatological disease in the classical sense, right? So we can be more precise based on the combination of this data, biomarkers, genetic data, other data, looking in a real-world context, electronic health record data, and now increasingly the third-generation data, data out of the daily life, data from living, not just clinical practice transactions in the past, but daily life. Uh, so I think uh, this is fascinating, and we will um, have successes. There will be low-hanging fruit, perhaps in rare diseases, in oncology, and, and others we have uh, certain examples. But also for the more common diseases that are complex and we don't understand how genetic and environment uh, come together, we will make progress, I think, based on, on these uh, advances, and I'm very optimistic. As the tools are democratized, right, as there is more computational capacity, less cost, speed, you could imagine uh, a totally different way to do clinical trials as well in which you can really combine, you know, th the schedule, just the daily schedule of the patient that is, of all the patients that are in that clinical trial with their electronic medical record, with their genomics information, with their phenotypic information, because all of that can be processed. And then the question is, is not if we do prospective or real-looking clinical trials, but how do we have them real-time adaptive where you as a patient have the opportunity to real-time fill in how you feel, what is the situation, put it in an algorithm, give back the feedback to the pharma company, and have you know, a, a specific um, I would say iteration of the trial that he is taking real-time data from all across 360. You know, that is, that is not so far off, mm -hmm. depending the agility of the regulatory framework. Yes, that's... L that's a little caveat. Sorry to bring, uh, to, to we'll, bring it we'll back. We'll come to, to this, at, yes. I think, at the very end, because that's going to be very political. But briefly, before we open the discussion to the floor, I'd, I'd like to come to this last point, which now becomes very important, that Liz has already mentioned, garbage in, garbage out. How do we get good data? Uh, I'll quote just a little study um, that um, was done in, in my hometown research institution where uh, people looked at the quality of medical records for a very simple diagnosis, which was heart failure, one of the easiest diagnoses that, that you could do. Um, the, if you looked at the health record coding numbers, you find about, well, a certain percentage of patients. If you looked at the lab values that, y that came with it, you would double that number. If you then did machine learning to, to understand what the physicians had written down, you would double the number again. And it seemed to continue like this, meaning that even the hospital records were so bad that you miss the large majority of cases. How do we get good data so that mining data is really valuable? I, I think you touch on a very important point, which is how we define disease. And we heard about this in, t in the sense of this, this particular genetic marker and what really is underlying the process. And, and I'm reminded, I thought you were going to say uh, you were going to add another category to heart failure, which I'm told by gerontologists, you know, those who take care of patients who really reach into their 100, you know, 100 years and old. And at least in the U.S., you can only die of one cause. And they don't know why a person <laughs> died who's 100. It's really hard to describe. It's actually very interesting. You know, maybe it's a systems failure or something. 
So you have to say something. So they say, we just put down heart failure because, yes, the heart does stop. So that could be adding again, and that's just completely missing, which I think is rather your point, the underlying real biology that's driving these things. And I suspect we're going to be able to redefine diseases just as we're redefining cancers into the molecular pathway driven as opposed to the specific organ in which it's played out. You know, we're seeing these underlying molecular pathways right across the different organ specific so-called cancers. We might be seeing diseases, um, you know, of tyrosine kinases that we see in metabolic and neuro you know, neurological and so on. You know, we might be just redefining through these high um, uh, level of data inputs, which we assume have to be good, but, <laughs> but we might start to redefine diseases, and then maybe that improves what one puts in into the medical record. Now, that's down the line, of course, but I, I think there's a real issue here, which is that we, we're not even knowing what it is half the time that somebody is dying of. Okay, at this point I'd like to invite questions also from the audience or comments and I hope we have somebody here from the pharmaceutical industry because there's going to be a tough time, only rare diseases, no clinical trials and most drugs wasted. So, where's, there's a question up here. On, okay. I'm very sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm not, not from pharmaceutical company. That's too bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Paolo Villari, and I'm coming from the, I am the, from the Department of Public Health and Infectious Disease of Sapienza University. Uh, I would like to, uh, to say something linked to what you said many times during this discussion, and I would like to come back to the problem of randomizing the control trial, because uh, I think uh, that uh, we have uh, to be careful about the fact uh, that we are saying uh, that randomized control trials uh, are not valid uh, anymore uh, in order uh, to evaluate uh, this kind uh, of technology. Uh, and uh, I'm trying uh, to explain why, because, uh, um, I mean, for many years uh, we had randomized uh, control trial as the unique uh, paradigm, you told, gold standard to evaluate uh, new technology. And now we are talking uh, about a new te technology, uh, because personalized medicine uh, is a new technology. So I do not think uh, that it's a good idea uh, to say that randomized control trials are not valid uh, anymore. Just uh, we have uh, to change uh, the approach, uh, because uh, there may be uh, that uh, we need good uh, epidemiologists uh, able uh, to randomize uh, well people. Uh, and uh, that I... Mm, I mean, I agree with you that the approach of randomization is not perfect, absolutely, and there's many pitfalls in evaluating personalized medicine. But this is the only method that we have. If we say that this method is not valid anymore, maybe that we run the risk that we don't have any method, and this could be the main barriers uh, on the implementation in the real clinical practice uh, of, this, of this kind uh, of approach. Okay. Yes, I think we're still in time of transition. There was another question up there on the back. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, Ross Koppel from Monash University. Uh, look, a very thought-provoking uh, discussion. I, I would like to also make a comment about this concept of retrospective analysis. So with the genome that contains 20,000 genes and some 3 million plus variants in those genes, if you want to go back and find an excellent correlation to any data that exists, you can find it. And so retrospective analysis can offer hypotheses to test but can never be relied on because all curves can be fitted when you have three million plus variables to choose one from. So you do need to go out uh, and do something to prove it. The other thing I want to remind everyone that just because the data gets bigger and because there are more variables, type one and type two errors don't disappear. And uh, particularly when you're getting to things that are rare, what you discover will most likely be false because that's the nature of statistics and something one can't run away from. 
So my final point relates to um, perhaps a comment about uh, precision medicine, which as a practitioner I feel I was always doing, which is working with a patient, trying approaches and observing the effect and then modifying and going on, going on the journey with that patient. And I look forward to better advice at the start, so perhaps my first choice can be more efficient and we can save, uh, we can save some uh, time and some patient suffering. Uh, I'll, I'll perhaps comment around this concept of medication. So I think we'd be aware that adherence is a huge problem. 30% of prescriptions that are written are never filled and it's estimated that in chronic diseases at least 50% of the patients are using the medication wrong. So perhaps to comment, what, where do we you know, implement as opposed to start the idea with a, with a data beginning? How do we see improved implementation into the health system? Thank you for these thought-provoking comments. You had the same comment and then there's another question here in the far right corner. Yeah, uh, George Fulm from University of Medicine, Rostock. Actually, that goes right to the topic of adherence. Um, isn't it a, could there not be a possibility that the way the right is administered every day or, or um, in a, in a, maybe in a different time scheme, that this also affects a lot on the, um, on the if, uh, that this also has a lot of effect on the drugs, um, on the drug as it uh, may, 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 it may be, uh, um, it may actually be helpful not to be adherent because in many cases the organism goes back to the normal state. So there's some uh, uh, homeostasis that may be reached. So you, uh, so you may actually want to uh, give a drug in intervals. And more generally, isn't it, it's always a problem that uh, those data are usually not there, that usually uh, for, for, um, you don't know how the adherence is and whether there may not be something also in the drug scheduling that is, pers that is also a, pers a contribution to the person's response to a drug. Yes, that's certainly yet another complication that, that can be added to the three million you were mentioning here, but there, uh, there's a voice to rescue this. Um, I would like to answer to some of the comments on clinical trials. I certainly would not dispute the value of a clinical trial, and I would never dare to do that. But I, my personal conviction is that genetics define us much more than we may think. We are not there to, to know everything about that, but I think if... Um, a clinical trial that doesn't discriminate uh, or stratify according to genetic data or knowledge will give us a result that's sometimes vanishing in the noise. That's what I believe. Um, if I go to my Montreal, to my city where I live and work uh, since many years, if uh, you go through the streets and Berlin will be no different, you would treat everyone the same that you see uh, going about their business. I, I think that's not the future. I think these the people respond differently according to their genetic makeup, and I think it's worthwhile revisiting uh, clinical trials with genetic information. I think that will lead to different clinical decisions according to genetic markers. Mm -hmm. Kevin? I would, if I may, Martin, also um, uh, have, I have a few comments with regard to the very, very difficult topic of adherence. Uh, and the clear relationship between lack of efficacy and, and adherence. And that's a human behavior by and large, and it's very difficult to, to get it. But I do think uh, there are some new promising um, 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 approaches that come from digital health approaches where you have um, sensors and, uh, that can monitor whether or not you know, a, a vial that contains the medication has been opened in a day or not, and so on. So uh, at least uh, we will generate increasingly data out of uh, daily life of people who uh, uh, should take their medication that help us understand better and focus at least uh, on, on those where we can actually show that there has been non-adherence and then try to understand what would it be that would make uh, those patients adherent learn. 
And I think uh, this is one of the opportunities for digital um, and telemonitoring and telehealth uh, where we can uh, hopefully have an impact in the future, understanding what contributes to non-adherence in daily life. I really very, very much want to support that point. I am intrigued by the thought that adherence to drugs can definitely be uh, enhanced by those digital processes. I almost like to call them the, the digital twin of a drug, right? Was that process which is digital and can support the citizen, the patient, the individual in its daily habits to be reminded, to be coached, to be um, enhanced, to be given a nudge for those of us that, you know, I've read the book, you know, you need that little nudge to change your behavior, that little incentive. And so Digital is part of our life. That's the way in which we communicate with friends. That's the way in which we work. That's the way in which we can be healed. And so um, this is, if you take, you know, um, uh, the diabetic population and diabetic retinopathy, the moment in which not only have you have adherence to a drug, but also adherence to a screening program, right? If you make it easy for people, and we have this experience in the US with uh, um, an organization called IRIS that makes the, the, the screening of uh, diabetic patients for uh, the likelihood of diabetic retinopathy very easily accessible with a diagnosis, with an image of the back of the retina. The image is processed in the cloud. The, um, the results come back very quickly. And the, by making it easy for people, thanks to digital processes, you have a screening adherence that goes up from 25% to 80%. That's huge in terms of the system, in terms of the cost and the human impact. So um, if digital is the way we live, that's also a way in which it can definitely boost adherence and it can also log easier. At what time do you take that medication? Because indeed, you know, that makes a difference in terms of the efficacy. My point would be that uh, if we take patients as partners and citizen scientists who are actually get an interest in the disease and in the parameters that tell them they are improving or regenerating and so on, this will be less of a problem. So, Are there more questions? Yes, here. Michael von Blanquet, founder of Precision Medicine Alliance. So I wonder, um, when I take the peril of Google Maps, how has your idea idea of navigating precision medicine, which means where you want to anchor all this data. And I feel like this is quite complex and not yet resolved. What, what can maybe a solution be? A somewhat related question since it has to do with data. Um, I'm Steve McCoskey. I'm from the legal department at Microsoft. I work closely with Elena. One of the things that I hear often in these discussions where large amounts of data is going to be critical. It's absolutely critical. And getting access to data is challenging. Pretty much everyone raised issues around data protection, data privacy, data access. My question is, to use sort of a golf metaphor, I often hear the medical community take these regulations as they lie. They let them, they say that's just the way the law is. We're increasingly starting to reach out and talk to patient groups and rare disease groups and ask, is that the right way for the law to be? Is, is where it's set now right? Is, is this balancing privacy benefits and potential benefits to society if data is more widely available yet protected, right? Yet protected in ways that keep people uh, from being discriminated against based on their data. And so I would throw that out there. What, what are the ways in which you would suggest, you don't have to be a data protection expert to answer this, how would you suggest the law and regulation around data be changed in ways to facilitate the work that you're doing around precision medicine. Good, thank you. Uh, let's take the uh, last two questions from the center rows. One was up there, yes. Now further up. Uh, 
and then, then down here again, yes. Okay. My name is Anna Larsson. I come from Sweden. I, I was thinking, who doesn't need nudging in this <laughs> room? <laughs> thinking about those, this uh, Nobel Prize winner of the Economic Prize this year, that I think maybe we all need some nudging to make it. We may need, but maybe not want. So there's another question further up. <laughs> Hello, I'm Bruce Trenga from Macquarie University in Uganda. I, uh, when we think of precision medicine, we think of chronic diseases, genetic diseases. But I wanted to ask the experts where they see uh, precision medicine help in infectious diseases. For example, if I give uh, TB, if someone has one million uh, germs and another one has five, should they get the same treatment or there's a way this uh, precision medicine could help to improve the management of these patients? Yeah, thank you. That's an important question. I think um, we'll take, is there another last question and then we'll have a final round where we take up these points and I could perhaps also ask you to make a short statement, each of you, where you think we will taking the next step. Steps. No more questions? Okay, so maybe we can go this round again. Uh, maybe I can answer the data protection what we think about that, we discussed that before the panel. First of all, there's consent forms, right? So the patient signs consent. And the consent for treatment and for analysis and everything, the consent has to contain a chapter on data so that the data are anonymized and be used uh, according to a legal framework. That's maybe not yet there, but that's the first step. Then the second thing is where are the data stored and who has the authority to manage the data? So for Canada, which has a state uh, healthcare system, this will be the same uh, authority that gathers the patient data and looks at the patient data. For the United States, I'm afraid somebody else has to answer, but that's, these are the first steps. And the other aspect of data is how are the diagnosis of precision medicine, be genetic or other, communicated to the patient? Now, uh, according with incidental findings or not, that is, for some diseases, that's already uh, fixed, but not entirely. So there are r efforts ongoing now to set down the ethical guidance or ethical guidelines, how to communicate the result of all the research to the patient and how the patient deals with this. Now, an example, in, in some countries, if there is a risk pregnancy, there can be taken cells from the fetus from the bloodstream of the mother, and the fetal cells can be whole genome sequenced, and the whole genome sequence costs $500, and if you want to pay for this, and maybe even you have an insurance to pay for this, you will have a whole, se whole genome sequence of the baby to be inspected. Already that is an ethical dilemma. What is communicated is certain sets of diseases that be apparent by the sequencing, but not the rest. So that's the situation right now. So this is what is it right now, and we are going to move forward in at least the setting that I know in, in Canada. Yes, uh, just a few uh, comments to some of the points that were raised, not to all points, um, but uh, to Michael von Blanke's point about where's this data going to be. I do believe that, uh, first of all, um, we see a shift in data ownership going from institutions uh, to data ownership going to the individual. And, and that is absolutely the right uh, development. And I think it will increase with the availability of platforms uh, where individuals have actually and can exert control over their health data. They know where they are and they know uh, who can access them and they permit uh, grant access and, and so on. And I think this can all be uh, accomplished through uh, these wonderful devices that we I probably venture to say all of us carry in our pockets. Um, and that can be in real time and wherever the individual is, uh, access to the data can be granted and the data can be accessed. And that requires a cloud uh, um, a solution, a platform that can do that at the Hasso Plattner Institute. Uh, which is a not-for-profit entity. We are developing such a solution. We are offering it. Uh, a big aspect of uh, uh, such a, a platform, a cloud solutions, personal control of health data, 
uh, is certainly trust. And therefore, in different societies, there are different levels of trust vis-a-vis -vis the state or vis-a-vis -vis corporations. I mean, we all know uh, in Europe we have a term that's called Googlephobia. Um, so I think in a neither corporate nor a uh, government, public, uh, state uh, uh, sector in a, in a trusted, uh, not-for-profit uh, uh, space, such a cloud can be developed and then used uh, by all stakeholders. And I have one more uh, um, uh, comment to the point of data protection privacy. It is indeed true that in many countries, uh, in particular in Germany, we need to work with uh, politicians and uh, the uh, leading politicians to actually become aware of what kind of benefit can now be uh, uh, gained for the individual and for society by, um, by having a different approach to privacy protection, to protect privacy, but not at the expense of stifling progress, which is unfortunately uh, all too often the case uh, this day and age, also considering the technological uh, possibilities we have. Here in Germany, we just had a national election, and there are uh, now uh, uh, negotiations between various parties to form a new uh, coalition government, and we, uh, myself and others, are actually actively talking with politicians to uh, uh, move forward, move the goalposts during the next four years through uh, uh, legislation that makes it easier to utilize data uh, that gives the individual uh, autonomy over uh, what the data can be used for to make it easier to give consent uh, for open future biomedical research for individuals. All these things need to be accomplished, and we're working towards that. Two closing remarks. First of all, I wanted to try and address the point of infectious diseases and honor that question that came. Um, and to that, le let's go to the story of one of the most um, dangerous animals in the world, which is mosquito. And let's imagine um, smart traps that are out there in the wilderness, um, put and collected by drones, um, uh, mosquito traps that can record the temperature, uh, the humidity level, the, w the wind level, the hour in which a specific mosquito gets into that trap. And a trap that, because of artificial intelligence and how mosquitoes um, are uniquely flying, can capture the right mosquito and actually you know, keep outside the moths and the crickets and, and whatever other bugs should be in there. And then the drone brings it back and the genomics analysis can see a, a, a difference between a shift and drift and then sends alert on, on uh, uh, a possible epidemic coming through. This is reality. This is something that our, actually our researchers have been also um, um, you know, testing and then putting into practice into, into the Houston area when there was the, um, the outbreak of the Zika virus. So yeah, I think that precision medicine you know, and genomics analysis applied uh, also in this context can make a difference. My closing remark um, would really be to the fact that uh, if we believe, if we are truly believing that better data save lives, we need to honor that in the way in which we um, rethink how we bring those data together into open and scalable platform that can make a difference and also into um, a cloud that people can trust. Microsoft has a very, very strong commitment to a cloud that you can trust, particularly here in Germany, uh, also in the alliance with these systems, making sure that we have a data trustee that uh, fulfills all the requirements and you know, in, in other different ways um, across the world. People will not use the technology that they cannot trust and at the same time when you show a patient what can be done with their data. At the beginning, they are reticent, but when you show the benefits, they are much more willing to share. And this is not me saying it. It's actually you know, um, research that comes particularly uh, from the UK, but also consistently around the world. So let's be all citizens, uh, a scientist, and, and share that data for better health. And I think passing the mic to uh, Elizabeth, you said something very meaningful to me, which is you spoke about precision prevention. And I think that is a 
very much important component of how we look at precision medicine. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And <clears throat> I would like to perhaps even go further and say, um, you know, when we s step back and we say, why are we so afraid of the data? It's because we are not trusting how it's going to be used. So maybe this calls for, uh, you know, perhaps learning from national platforms, but saying, well, maybe this calls for a very clear international agreement on when data is going to be used in a discriminatory way. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, I know people worry about their insurance, for example, and that, that is a very large fear. It's an economic fear, right? And so, so maybe this calls for something much uh, sort of beyond um, the fear of the data because we, we're treating data as though it's very dangerous. And in fact, we know what benefits it, it can bring, but it's only dangerous because there's, um, as was referred to, the regulatory aspects of it are inadequate to, um, you know, allay people's fears. But I think, like prevention, like all things to do with health, these are very international things. You know, we can't prevent Zika from one country to another, so we have to look at it and attack it at an international level. So this is going very beyond and very ambitiously, but maybe this is the way to go. The Paris Accords for climate uh, issues were done internationally because it was pointless to have one country, uh, you know, have adherence to standards and another not. So maybe this is the way we have to think of this because we won't get the benefit of the sharing unless we can allay these kinds of fears. Thank you. And the last. So maybe first to the question whether some people, why some people are more susceptible to a given infection than others and whether precision medicine will help us in understanding that. I think we are already having kind of an understanding of that in the basic principle, the genes controlling immune responsiveness, the major has the compatibility antigen genes belong to the most uh, polymorphic genes uh, of all. And uh, apparently uh, evolution has taken care that we offer a wide spectrum of reactivities to any given pathogen but we may, a poor responder to pathogen A may be a good responder to pathogen B. But I think without precision medicine, we will not understand for a given individual what it means and for a given uh, inf infection. I think evolution doesn't care so much for the individual, but precision medicine does. So and uh, that, is, uh, that is, I think, the promise in that. For me as a scientist, um, I think that one important uh, thing is the compliance of the patient, citizen, um, si uh, taking them as citizen scientists uh, so that we not not only in the forefront of the therapy that is in predictive and diagnostic steps can use precision medicine but also afterwards when the patient actually already is feeling improving or feeling better much better I think uh, we need also the tools of precision the equipment of precision medicine to moni monitor the regeneration or remission or re possible relapses and in certain cases, uh, to understand um, uh, the biology of human diseases uh, much better in a funda much more fundamental way and become more independent, actually, from the very imperfect mouse models. Well, we are coming to an end. I'd like to thank all the panelists for uh, a vivid discussion. Uh, for you, um, all the questions you had, I'm sorry we were a bit over time, but I think there are so many issues that need to be discussed and to conclude, we all need a little nudge. Thank you for being here. And uh, I wish you all a great World Health Summit. <laughs>